hey everybody welcome back to this next episode of the ceo for life experience podcast vlog um whatever they're being called these days <laughs> i'm here with uh, jeremy allenball and jeremy allenball is currently the chief executive officer of the chattanooga football club um, I do want to give a little bit of disclaimer here. Jeremy is a friend of mine. Our daughters actually play volleyball together, and we've uh, we've shared many tears and many joys along the way of that club seasons. But um, Jeremy has, uh, in the last six months, taken on a role of being CEO for the Chattanooga Football Club, and I thought it'd be really great not only to get um, – I just care about his experiences, what I've learned about him. I think he's a wonderful person. So I just want to share that with, with you as an audience, but love to get his view on what it's like to be a newer CEO. Uh, and I'm sure that'll give us some great insights and we'll walk through that, but maybe um, Jeremy, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate having me on. And it's different not to see each other in a gym early on a set or a convention center, I guess, early on a Saturday or a Sunday morning or late on a Saturday night, but um, appreciate getting a chance to get on here and, and chat a little bit. Super. Well, listen, um, as those that are listening and have been listening for a while, the CEO for Life Experience and Podcast is all about um, just engaging with people that um, they're acting as the CEO, not only of their role, if that's their former role as a profession or an entrepreneur, but they also operate that way in their life, that um, they create vision around where their direction is going and where their trajectory is in life, and then they execute on that. And so we try to learn from these people, and that's what we're going to do today. So maybe just real quick, give us the uh, quick pitch on um, your background, Jeremy, so maybe we can connect a little deeper with uh, your story. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know how quick it'll be, but I think it's important to kind of walk through it, to be honest. So um, I'm not going to go all the way back, but I will go back pretty far. So grew up in a very small uh, farming community, actually, in northern Illinois. And the reason I'm telling you this is uh, soccer was the main sport in our town. And uh, my dad was a high school coach and a history teacher at the time, lived there to about fifth grade, and we had no American football. And I, like most kids, I grew up playing you know, football in the side yard, play Little League baseball, but in basketball, but soccer was the driver. And our homecoming game was around soccer, our homecoming parade. Uh, we had international uh, exchange students come to our small little town because a fantastic high school soccer program and went to state. Um, so that kind of shaped me in terms of just that uh, ability to have connections, um, just how a community can really get behind something. And it was a great place to grow up. Fast forward, move to Champaign, Illinois, where there was no high school soccer, and more of the traditional, you know, football, basketball, baseball. And I remember um, going to a school board meeting and I should say that my dad was uh, assistant, was a principal at the time there and eventually became assistant superintendent, superintendent, all that, but going to school board meeting where a bunch of parents said, Hey, look, our youth club will commit to funding these three high school programs in Champaign-Urbana. Um, if we get a little bit of help from the school district and this was 88, 89, something around there, I think. So, um, I saw the power of what people can do when they really want to do something and pull it off. So had this big high of soccer is the end all be all in this little town to didn't even have a high school program, but I saw people push that through and get it going. So um, from there, like most kids uh, played high school, you know, soccer, played club team, Olympic development, went off to college, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, had a tremendous experience there, really shaped me in terms of type of people I wanted to be around. Um, I, I don't chase titles or projects. I chase good people. And I've been, a lot of dumb luck has put me around some really good people that way. Uh, finished there, went to grad school at Missouri State University in Springfield, Missouri, and was assistant coach there for Division One program. Again, surrounded by really quality people. Fast forward, moved to Chicago for an experience to run, uh, to be one of the directors of a top youth uh, boys club in the country. At the time, we were winning national championships, placing players in the pros, Division One college programs, but really learned the business side uh, of the business there back to Springfield um, to have our daughter at Sydney, who that's our connection there, and um, to St. Louis for 10 years. And that's where I kind of transitioned from the coaching directing side into this administrative role type VP, GM, and now, as you said, eventually CEO. St. Louis for those 10 years, um, mm -hmm. five on the youth side, transferred into uh, the professional side when we purchased the franchise there, the club did, five years there get a message on LinkedIn. Hey, there's this really cool club in Chattanooga. The power uh, of LinkedIn. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I've heard of Chattanooga Football Club. 
And I, you know, they've been pretty famous for a lot of things they had gone through and um, just a unique setup and a startup venture since 2009. Came down on a crappy rainy weekend, fell in love with the people. Couldn't fall in love with the area because it was miserable for right. two days, but yeah. fell in love with the people. And here we are. And uh, just really have enjoyed the time. And, um, you know, my path has been different than maybe some others in terms of getting to this role. As I said, this wasn't an objective I didn't set out. I want to oversee a protein by the time I'm 45 or 50. I never have done that. It's just been like, oh, there's some really interesting people. You do your research, you do your background, you go do the interview. Um, you talk to people that know them that don't know that you know them and you find out what makes them tick. And I've been fortunate to do that every step of my way. And uh, here we are today. You know, it's really interesting with your story. And so I want to hit on this a little bit and we'll get into some of these um, other questions. You, you mentioned that you didn't necessarily have a, um, you weren't chasing a particular paycheck or a package. You were, you had aligned yourself in something that was purposeful to you, right? And then you just, you navigated in that pond or that river or whatever that was. Talk a little bit about that because, you know, a lot of times as people are pushing towards leadership roles or trying to be um, in a certain a certain way and be successful, a lot of times it's, it's you know, going after a certain package. And the reason I bring this up is, you know, I went to school and became an engineer through education because engineers made money. But within three years of working, I was like, I'm awful at this. This is not what I was meant to be, be doing. And so I need to make an adjustment. So walk me through, how did you, how did you navigate not falling into that trap? How did you stay with inside that lane that, that was the connection for you? I think it um, goes back to finding your purpose. And as I said, you know, both parents, educators, coaching, what have you, being around people, uh, you're just pretty fortunate and lucky. And I remember calling my dad from my dorm room on a Saturday afternoon. This is when you have, you know, landline phones, right? And, um, I called him and said, uh, well, guess what I just did? I changed my major. And he's like, okay. And I go change the education. He's like, told you. I'm like, yeah, I know. Of course you did. And because um, I thought I was going to teach and I was going to coach. So, because I, I we done we ran a little clinic the varsity you know men's soccer team did on a Saturday and it was a lot of guys were complaining whining why we got to do this and I just loved it and so I really fell in love with coaching and instructing and um, you know did my student teaching and I figured mm, this isn't for me you know uh, when I'm on the field with players they all want to be here and they all really want to work hard and train uh, and yeah. push and challenge right. in the right. classroom. You don't always get that. And maybe they love their math class, but they right. really don't care about that U.S. history class that you're teaching them. So for me, I quickly figured out, OK, if I become a teacher, then she'll get a great pension. I'd seen that to my parents and, you know, all that stuff. I have my summers off, um, you know, can be flexible in terms of where you live and move. But my purpose was going to be being with those kids on the field every night, training them. Right. I go to the college level, love the competition, the Division One athletes make it the NCAA tournament, but that was for three months. And the other nine months you were running camps, recruiting, fundraising. And the best part of my day was being on the field with those players. Mm -hmm. So I switched to the club side, right? And because at the club side, you're on the field from five to 10 every night, right. games on the weekends. Yep. And so I just chased again, that purpose of what was going to be fulfilling to me. And then as I slid into the pro side, it was like, okay, you know, uh, I, I want to keep having that feeling, you know, I love game days, but I also love the build up to game days and, um, you know, just seeing everybody come in and having that first experience or seeing that season ticket holder that's showing up for the 15th time all season. And they're just as excited as they were on opening day. So, you know, for me, it's just been good role models. Again, I'm gonna go back to that dumb luck. I've been around people that just love what they do. And, um, it was never really, it was never really, you know, taught about or part of my DNA as a person to go chase these things. You know, again, a, a family of farmers. And I thought I was, I thought I was going to take over the family farm forever. That was what I was going to do. Um, and, you know, then obviously that, that didn't occur, but it was just like, what makes you happy? And yeah. I've just been lucky to have some people around me that have just said, you know, push me to do that as opposed to push, you know, certain titles or paychecks and um, things that way. So, yeah, just been kind of my path. That's awesome. So let's jump into some of these nuts and bolts around CEO and what what that term means and, and let's apply it maybe to life and some profession stuff as we walk through this. 
So what do you think makes a good CEO? So, you know, uh, I hate to sound like this is almost like an interview, like we're sitting here for the role, <laughs> but you know, but that's what this is, right? We're here to talk right. about like being CEO, not only of a, of a profession and a business, but also how it translates to life. It doesn't just, you don't just, I'm sure you just don't leave the door and leave all of your CEO skills and traits and everything in the office. It takes with you everywhere in your life. So what do you think makes a good CEO? I think the people that I've been around in this role that I'm now find myself in, I think there's a couple commonalities that they all have. One, they're all great connectors. You know, they stay connected with people, um, whether it's people they've worked with in the past, whether it's people they're now working with, or just as important, who do they want to work with in the future? Um, so, you know, building those connections. And if we got one positive out of COVID, I think it's that our world became so much smaller. And, you know, now through the power of Zoom and Google Meet, we find time to connect with people. And, you know, we used to do it through phone calls, you know, grabbing a coffee, grabbing a beer with somebody. And now you, you can do it, you know, face to face through a virtual way. But I think you have to be a good connector. Um, and I think the second thing is you, you have to be, you have to show the people that you work with that you're in the trenches with them. And all the leaders that I've been around, you know, didn't sit up in their corner office, um, you know, didn't walk in at 901, uh, didn't leave at 502. You know, they were, they were with you. And if it was days where you had to show up early, they were there. If it was days where you stayed late, they were there. They also walked in at two o'clock and said, Hey, let's get out of here. You know, we got a long weekend coming up with, you know, we have a home game on Saturday, another one on Wednesday, it's Thursday afternoon. Let's get out of here and recharge our batteries. Okay. You know, so I think you, you have to have that vision and that ability to connect with people, to show people that you're there with them. And then you have to be able to read people and when to put the foot on the gas. And then also when to kind of, you know, stop the car and tell people to get out and let's go do something fun and enjoy those uh, parts of the job. And that does carry over. I mean, I'm dying to ask you, how's Kennedy season going? You know, is she excited about Kyle? I want to connect with you. And, you know, and that's just what I do. And so I try to connect. Um, and our staff is pretty small. My family's pretty small, at least my, you know, intimate family. So there's not a, you know, it's not like I got to touch base with 60 employees every day. But I've also been around CEOs or presidents that made it a point to check in with everybody in the stadium that day, check in with the people in, you know, the food and beverage department, check in with the grounds crew, check in with the youth staff, check in with the ticket team. And, you know, the pa Patrick Berry was a president I worked for, worked with in St. Louis, and he was so good at that. And I grabbed that from him. And even though I have a smaller staff now, I'm still checking in with them. I'm checking in with my brothers and I'm checking in with people I used to work with. And I think you have to have that connection and that ability to connect with people to, to succeed in this role. Yeah, I was just writing down a bunch of points that we can unpack on this. That was awesome. That's really great. So, you know, so the first thing you talked about was this, you know, we talked about connection, but I thought what was really interesting is that is that the deeper connection piece. And so, um, you know, there's this concept of the monkey tree, right? And I heard about this a long time ago. I'm not sure who came up with it, but, you know, you ha I, it's this visualization of an organization with monkeys, right? And so as, as monkeys move up the ladder, when they're looking back down, you know, all they see is these faces smiling up, but everybody at the bottom, all they see are the asses up at top, right? <laughs> so there's this, you know, it's the whole point is you gotta move up and down, right? You just can't stay in your hierarchy of where you're at when you're trying to connect and you're trying to lead people and you're trying to be that way. So, you know, obviously, I mean, you have P and L responsibilities, you have, um, you have risk associated with these events, you have recruiting, there's, there's all of these things that are happening besides connecting, how do you go around prioritizing and then we'll go deeper into what connection means but i i'm really interested to find out like how do you how do you prioritize and in identify and go through the process of of saying this is where i need to focus this is my priority right now so a couple of different ways and i'm not a great routine guy i'm just going to throw that out there i don't wake mm -hmm. up at the same time every day i don't come home at the same time every day and i think that allows me to prioritize better um, mm -hmm. i've done the you know, make a list and some days, some weeks I'll do five critical tasks. Right. And it's like, okay, I'm in the shower. I'm getting ready for the day. What are the five things that have to get done today? I'll mm -hmm. throw them in my phone and then I'll cross them off. And those five are done. I can move on to something else, but I would be a liar if I told you I did that every day. Cause I don't. And yeah. I, it's one of the things that I enjoy about this role is every day is different. Today was just strictly in the office, reconnecting with staff after um, a long weekend. The team is in California, texted with the coaches a little bit, checked in on them, see how things are going. Tomorrow will be completely different. Tomorrow, I have a ton of meetings with some of our corporate partners as we talk about renewals. 
um, have a meeting with our marketing team to check in on our final promotions. So I think you just kind of, you have to read, read the room a little bit. And it's kind of like when you're coaching, when do you call that timeout? When do you make that sub? You know, there is no cookbook or recipe book in terms of how to go about your day or your week. I think you have to navigate through it and you learn a little bit. But I think for me, the best way that I do that is sometimes I make lists, sometimes they're up here. Um, but I'm always looking at, you know, what are we doing to pursue our mission statement? What are we doing to make sure we're looking ahead, not just to the next game, but to the next season? Um, so just a variety of ways. But uh, for me, that works. For others, I realize they have to have a, you know, a list of things that got to get done this week, things that they can work on from a strategy standpoint this week, and then maybe some planning, you know, that they can work on two weeks from now. But for me, uh, it just kind of goes back to the coaching and looking at the season and looking at, okay, you're always, I always started with defending first. So I'm going to teach my team. If we can defend, we have a chance to win any game. And then from there, we'll work on this and we'll build and we'll build and we'll build, right? So I kind of look at my week as a season and what do I need to do early in this week to make sure we're going to be ready towards the end of it. So, yeah, this, I was hoping this is where the discussion was going to kind of line us, you know, quite honestly, I had this little, I had this little secret hope we were going to go down this road because I did have this little bit of, um, of, of speculation coming into this was like, how much did the years as a coach DNA help in the process of becoming this role, right? That you're in and where you're at and you know just you know just what you said is the ability to read the room right and you talked about yes we we went in with a game plan we know you know to be on the defense and then we can worry about the rest and not allowing the game plan to be a prison allowing us to adjust and move and go through those things you know i, I think that's i think that's a pretty amazing thing to, to talk about is like the similarities between coaching because you have a team right regardless yeah yeah very much and that team's going to change, you know, players are going to switch teams, you know, when you're work coaching younger kids, somebody's going to choose, you know what, I'm gonna go full time basketball, and I'm not going to play soccer anymore. And so there's always that movement. It's the same thing, especially in today's workforce, right. And in lower league sports where we are, you know, this is not the NFL, this is not the NHL, you know, it's, um, you know, we're an entry level for a lot of people. Um, we're fortunate here at CFC that we have some good senior level people too. And we're trying to make this a place where nobody wants to leave. But the reality is at some point they're going to. So it's similar to a team in that way, but the best teams are the ones that have a common purpose. They have that goal. Um, you know, they're focused on the day to day. They're not focused on winning the championship three months from now. They're focused on building blocks, getting better. Um, and I think business uh, is very, very s similar to that. And, you know, you have to find some commonalities. Uh, there's people in our office that I'll go get a beer with once a week. There's others that, um, unless it's an outing, a planned outing, I don't see them on the social side. But um, you just have to figure out how to to fit all those pieces together and and then what's your management style. And I think definitely I've been told there's a lot of um, coachisms or what have you. No Ted Lasso, well, that's not me, but there's a lot of coachisms in my leadership style, but you, mean you don't you bring cookies in every day. I mean, come no, on. Oh, there's, there is no biscuits for the boss. Um, but, um, you know, I do think that there are a lot of little, you know, similarities between those things. As you said, it's, um, you know, you're just building your team to go achieve a different goal as opposed to trying to win a game on a Saturday night. So. So talk a little bit more about, about, um, this connecting piece. And so, because you're in, you're not only running a business that is talent internal, right? But you're responsible for, for scouting talent outside as your business, right? So talent is a big discussion right now across all companies. Every company right now is in huge talent acquisition mode. Tons of money is being invested in that process. But then you mentioned also the part about maintaining and keeping. And I think what I'm seeing and people that I'm talking to is they're not doing a good enough job closing the back door. And so maybe you can share with us a little bit about that. So I think everyone's really familiar right now with talent acquisition. Um, and I, I'm sure you have some insights with what you do, but talk a little bit, teach us a little bit about what your thoughts are on, on around your retention and engagement. How do you keep, you can't keep everybody, you've already said it, but how do you go about, you know, go, it's, I mean, I'm sure you have thoughts. I, I want to hear your thoughts around yeah. that. Yeah. No, I think one of the things from the from the get go is we push that, you know, when we're going through the interview process, I think it starts there. I think retention starts with the acquisition, whether it's players in the field, season ticket holders, people that you work with in, in our front office. 
is it goes from the beginning. We don't want somebody to buy a season ticket for Chattanooga Football Club if it's not the best thing for them. Maybe a flex pack where they come to six games instead of 18 is best for them. So we try not to force people into that because then they're not happy. You know, they're not going to come back the next year. If they have a bad experience and they tell their friends, yeah, I bought the season ticket package, but, you know, I only went to seven games. And, you know, so you, first, I think it starts there. Same thing when you're bringing in talent on the player side, you have to be upfront with them. Here's what our coach believes in. Here's the style that we play. Here's how our fans relate to our players. Here's how we travel. Um, here's the things that we do. And I think, and same thing with the front office. So if you do a good job up front, you have a better chance on the backside of it. Um, we're not great at it, to be honest, in terms of the front office. I think a little bit is the COVID piece. A little bit is, you know, a lot of entry level positions. Um, but it has been our primary focus this year. We've had two focuses. I can't tell you the first one, unfortunately. I'm not trying to hold anything back. But the second, the, the second one is um, absolutely taking care of our people. So I'll give you an example. There's somebody who's uh, in a senior level position came to me and said, hey, you know, about, it's about time for performance review. It's about time for budgeting for next year. I want to go get my master's online. Can we talk about that? Absolutely. And what was so great was he came to me with that idea, even though I was thinking about it, I didn't have to go ask him. And so having that open door and again, that connectivity where he had the confidence to say, hey, Jeremy, if I do this, it's going to allow me to grow. It's going to allow the club to grow. And I think this is going to be really beneficial for, for all of us. So that kind of kicked me a little bit, you know, in, in the rear end to say, okay, how many other staff members do I have that would like to go do some additional training on ticket sales or somebody that's going to progress from an entry level into a manager position? What kind of training can we go get for them, you know, that I've been fortunate enough to go through? So, um, and then I think the other thing that we do that I brought from St. Louis is in sports and a lot of other businesses too. And this kind of became a big thing. And now I think it's kind of gone away. We just have we have an unlimited vacation policy. You know, we, we do not clock in and check out. The only thing is we uh, have weekly staff meetings and we have biweekly one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, with that. And we have a management team meeting. Other than that, just get your job done. And we have guys that come in at seven because they want to get out at four and go for a run, get that workout in, go for that hike, you know, uh, when the weather's nice. And we have others that come in at 10 and they'll stay till six, six 30, because that fits them. So, you know, knowing your staff and then find out what makes them tick, I think helps you in terms of the retention piece, um, because then you can kind of remind them of those things or tweak some of those things that they have. So don't have a ton of great answers. It's an area, honestly, that we're looking at as an organization. How can we do more to keep our talent here? We've, we lost a really good one earlier this year. And um, so we learned from it and just trying to, you know, constantly develop and, and grow in that area. But I think it all, to me, it all starts with how honest, how open are you, and what are you looking for when you bring people in? And then I think you have a better chance of keeping them on the backside. I uh, love that. You know, just you, you mentioned some things that I think are so critical right now. You know, you mentioned the one-on-ones, right? The weekly staff meetings that, you know, most people do that. But that continuous feedback process of having something on the schedule where we're going to do one-on-one, -on -one, we're going to talk about, you know, whatever it is we're going to talk about, in making that connection that goes back to that connection piece but when you mentioned this employee that had the understanding there's a culture that you know he saw that there's value for me there's a value prop for the organization let me talk about this master's thing that's going to develop both of us and be a value going forward and, and those kind of things and i think that's super critical is like one of the things that i'm talking a lot about right now with organizations is this, you know, the performance appraisal system has a place, you know, you need to have measures, you need to have goals, you need to push those things forward. But that is not, again, in any way, shape or form to take over the fact that there's a person sitting there that has hopes, dreams, desires, life that's changing in a moment's notice that may, may not be in the career ladder that's in a job description, right? And so you need to be able to have those discussions or have some sort of vehicle or sort of channel in order to allow those discussions. And one-on-ones are a great way to do it. If you don't have a formal process or don't want to use a formal process like, you know, strategic career planning or professional planning, you know, one-on-ones is a great way to have those discussions, right? I mean, is that your experience? Is that what you see? Yeah, it is. I think it's, um, especially with the younger staff, you know, and, and some of our, even our, some of our senior staff haven't spent a lot of time in, in sports but they have the characteristics and the uh, attributes that I liked. And so we brought them in and they've taken off. They've done really well. Uh, so now it's a, that one-on-one -on -one time is a, a little bit of an opportunity 
just to check in with them and, you know, make sure that they feel, you're feeling comfortable, you know, what's going on. And, and also at a personal level, there were so many times, uh, I'm going to go back to them again, where my, my bosses, my director, wait a minute, you get personal you at work. Hold on. Wait, 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 I know. What? Time out, wait, right? what? Yeah. wait, what? Um, wait. <laughs> sorry. I had no. to, because it's such a pet peeve for me. It's like, we can be personal. Yes. It's okay. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. It, it, it better be right. Because right. The, the worst thing is like, if I don't know, um, something that's going on, then how can I, how can I deal with it uh, on the business side? Because maybe I see a drop in productivity, or I just notice like, you know, something's off a little bit. If I'm not dialed in to know what, what's going on, maybe their favorite college football team lost the game on Saturday. <laughs> so they're down to the dumps on, so I don't know, you know, but you have to know your people. And I, again, I, I just go back to the people that I've worked for. That's always been a huge driver. And I've had business metrics beaten into my head. I've had winning beaten into my head, staying under budget, all those things, but get to know your people. And again, it goes back. You can't ask a player to show up in the weight room at 6 a.m., ride on a bus all night, you know, get up and take a test and then, you know, go to school all day at the college level, do those things if you're, if you're not connected with them. So I think, the, you know, being a college coach and going through that recruiting process was so important for me because now I'm just going through it with, with you know, different, in a different role, you know, in terms of the recruiting and just checking in with people. But um, yeah, we're, you know, been pretty fortunate that way that I've been around people that knew me and took that time and I saw that and I grabbed it and like, okay, so I can, you know, I can do that too. And it's okay to have those connections. Um, so yeah, we're, we're focused on our people. I think we've built a good culture, a, a really good culture. Um, but like you said, it's just, everybody's looking for talent right now. And when you have good people, you also have to be okay with moving them on too. And that's when we do our internship program. One of the biggest things that we talk about in the beginning is here's where our interns have gone. Some of we've hired here, some have gone here, 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 and here, and we will do what, if you do a good job, we'll do whatever we can to help you with your placement. And I think when your staff hears that, then they feel that too. Like, you know what, if there's an opportunity for me to go closer to home or my fiance, fiance got a job and, you know, we're going to, we're going to relocate there. This guy will go to bat for me because, you know, you have that connection with them. And when you have that openness, I think that's really beneficial because then you don't have very many surprises. I've yet to have somebody come and knock on the door Friday at 8 a.m. and say, hey, I'm out in two weeks. It's always been like, hey, you got a minute? Sure. You know, I've had a few people reach out to me. I'm thinking about a few things. I'm not going to leave you hanging. Um, and I'd love to get your advice. Great. Let's go get a coffee tomorrow morning and talk about it. And then, you know, that would go on for two, three, four, five weeks. And then they come and go, hey, you know what? I got my final interview tomorrow, no problem. But to have that relationship, um, I think is so important so you don't get caught off guard um, you know, by people because people are gonna pursue other opportunities. That's just part of life. You know, that's, you know, that's a really, it, in tight organizations, which most organizations are now, and if they are not tight in the last two years, they're about to get really tight. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it's it's important to be able to let go and just, you know, and understand that and have a have a piece about that person's being released to the next. Right. And that's a great thing. And that's going to pay dividends regardless. I love your philosophy and I can tell that's your culture there. Tell me just real quick. So let's um, let's dive into a little bit about this, because a lot of times we like to hear from leaders about how they lead. How are you being led? So this is part that I like to talk about. It's like, how is Jeremy investing? Because, you know, Jeremy, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Um, we like to probably think we are, um, but you know, if we really try to get the feedback, there's areas where we need to grow and things that we're working on. And so, you know, as you reach this role that you're at, you know, it, it seems to be on top of a, a you know, a, a spire somewhere. Obviously, you're investing and in, investing. You so, what are your thoughts about continuing to grow? How do you do that? How are you intentional about your growing and your growth? And what do you look for in terms of people that pour in you? Is it formal? Is it informal? Is it a mix? Let's walk through how Jeremy goes being coached. In, in growing. Yeah. No, that's a good one. That's a deep one too. Um, so I think, again, I'm going to go back to the chasing the people piece, right? I came here and a big part of it, and I don't mind saying it, and I don't think I'm going to get in trouble, but a big reason I came here is because of Mayor Tim Kelly. Uh, he wasn't the mayor at the time. He was the chairman of our board. And I remember he called me during the interview process before I was supposed to come down. And he just gave me a heads up on a meeting I was going to go into and how many people were going to be in this meeting. And had he not given me that heads up, I don't know if I would be sitting here in Chattanooga today. 
because he kind of gave me a heads up about walking into a room with 15 people for an interview, which was crazy, but I was warned, so I was okay. And then I got to know him and I got to know, you know, others that uh, are on our ownership group. So again, I go around to those people. Now I don't get to work with, with Tim on a day-to-day basis because he's been removed from the club and now is, you know, running the city. But initially he was here when we were going through COVID. So I got a good connection with him. Um, I still talk to people that I worked with back in St. Louis. I'm a big podcast guy. So, you know, there's a handful of ones I listen to, but again, if there's a, a good author or somebody that I follow on LinkedIn or something that's relevant to me, I'll listen to those. I don't necessarily have a podcast. I listen to the same one every week. You can see a pattern here. Again, I'm not that routine guy. Um, but I look for those things and just try to have that growth mindset. Um, not as big of a reader as I need to be, you know, probably about one book a month. I'd like to get that up to two, but, um, just hasn't happened yet. That was a goal in 22, but at least I'm sticking with the, the one a month. And then I just also, anytime I go to an event, whether it's, you know, a volleyball game, a college football game, I'm always looking, I'm learning. I tell our staff the same thing. Like, look, you might be going up to UT for a football game on an off Saturday. Look around, you know, what do you see in the stadium? What do you like? We took our staff to a lookouts game. You know, I visit with their president, Richmond Zinga, like, hey, what trends are coming? Where are you guys at? There's a little group of us um, sports professionals here in Chattanooga that get together for lunch once a month, pick their brains and stuff. And, you know, there's been a few other people that as I was kind of transitioning from St. Louis to here, that I really got in depth. One of them is a guy named Cam- Cameron Schwab. And he's out of Australia and he was the youngest CEO or managing director at the time of an Australian rules football AFL club. And he was 20 something. His dad had 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 similar role and he kind of grew up in the business. Um, But he's really, really intriguing. And he has three questions um, that I personally go back and I ask myself every three to six months. And the first one is what does this role ask of me? And it's a deeper thinking and a leadership piece and a human piece. It's not a KPI. It's not about, you know, what type of revenue items do we, lines we need to hit um, this month, but really what does the, you know, what does the, the role ask of me? And then the second question is, um, you know, uh, what do I expect out of the role? Because whether it's in our life, whether it's in our, our profession, um, with our family, you know, there's expectations that we should have out of that role. That role has to be fulfilling to us, you know, being a husband, being a dad, being a coach, being a, a CEO, being a brother, you know, there's expectations out of that role too. Um, and so wh- you know, what is that, that role going to give back to me? And then the third one is what do I expect for myself to fulfill this role? And what am I prepared to give up and what for, to do this job or to do this role? And what am I not prepared to give up? You know, um, the only thing that I'll miss uh, a family event for is a home game, you know, um, away games, I won't go on an away trip if, you know, we have a college recruiting visit or a volleyball tournament or a family thing. I've missed a handful of family vacations for sure. Um, You know, our family usually takes our vacations October, November when we're out of season, uh, which is different. So there's been a lot of things I've had to miss, but there's some things I just won't, I won't miss. I won't give up. But those are the three questions. And I find myself about every three to six, about every three months now asking myself and I sit down I write them all down, yeah. take a good look at it. And then I go back and see, are my answers different? Are they the same? And i um, been pretty fortunate, again, stumbling upon this, you know, guy on a, on a podcast, like, whoa, there was a connection. Like I related to him, you know, his dad grew up in the business. He was a young person going into that business, a lot of similarities and, you know, been pretty fortunate uh, to just kind of follow him. And he does a pretty good job of putting out stuff on LinkedIn but that's how I learn and grow is just staying connected, uh, staying relevant, you know, with people observing things that I, you know, when I go to events, whether it's whatever, a concert or anything, uh, reading podcast and just trying to be aware. And, you know, it's hard to not be all consumed into everything. Cause there's so much information. Yeah. You could just sit on Netflix, you know, for a day and watch sports documentaries and you'll pick up one little thing out of, out of all of them. Right. But, um, I think there's a lot of learning that can happen that way in terms of, you know, you, somebody said, Hey, you know, uh, the first time you had to let somebody go, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I watched a lot of hard knocks on HBO and I saw players get cut from NFL training camp all the time. And I saw the emotion, the connection, but I also saw how quick and how clean it was. For sure. So unfortunately in this role, sometimes you have to make changes when you do it, 
you try to have that personal connection you try to get it quick and move on and i remember the first time i sat with somebody like you done that before i'm like uh no not really but watch watch some tv and figure out what to do from some nfl general managers but um or if you're not you know picking up somebody's contract or things like that so you just try to you know you try to steal as much as you can and then but really important put your own spin on it and what i've seen from you is you're taking a lot of pieces you know from other people in this world in this business but this is this is like authentic you know robert barber in terms of the stuff i see you put out like you are being you and that's not allowing you to connect with other people throughout the world and i think you can read books you can listen to things and if you try to be that person and not be yourself you're wasting your time and you're wasting other people's time so you For just sure. have to really you have to figure out what you're good at and then how can you become better and what you're not good at try to make some slight improvements but you got to do it your way yeah i love that you know I, I have to tell people because they get really wrapped up in this investment thing about you know but really i find people fall really in two buckets it works well with them there's like there's this artist and then there's the mechanic right the mechanic has an instruction set that works for them they go down that route for their growth and their investment and how they they, they learn right they need that training material and then there's the artist that sometimes i like to paint acrylic sometimes i like to try oils sometimes i'm going to work with stone right you know and i'm trying these different things but i'm learning as i go through them and then I think there's also another subset of us that move between both, right? I mean, depending on where we're at. And so I, I would happen to categorize you probably a little bit more of an artist. <laughs> I, I can't draw, but I definitely am willing to scribble on paper and right. put down thoughts and, yeah. um, you know, go back to it. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it just, it fits me and it fits, you know, my background and, and kind of what I've been through. The, um, <laughs> You know, one of the things I thought that was interesting is, is we're talking about this is your journey again wasn't one where you set out to say, this is the title or the chair of the office that that's going to work for me and this is where I'm going to go. And there was some there was some posts that I saw today that I thought it was interesting is because it was um, something into the to the nature of. Um, most new leaders have these really big egos right and, that, and it was like a little bit of a knock on a negative right that this thing that they were going after. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that. I think most of us are, are you know, regardless of, of background, you know, wherever, if we're trying to pursue anything of greatness, there's ego involved. That's just how it is, regardless, right? But it's obviously how you check it. The one thing that I thought was really interesting is like, and I'd like to get your take on this is, um, you know, what interests you in being a leader? Because again, it's not something you, you didn't go out to get the t-shirt. It's just something that you've been doing. And so what interests you about leading people? Like why? because it's sacrificial it's suffering it is it is not it is it is that so what interests you about that i think it's it's you know um seeing people seeing people happy and and seeing somebody happy doesn't mean they've been happy that whole process right like seeing the struggles that they go through but getting to that end result um so I'm, again i'll go back to a game day at the end of a game day it is a it is exhausting. I mean, you are uh, doing all the last little minute stuff during the, in the morning, you know, you're checking on things for us as an outdoor event, we're checking the weather. Is it going to rain before the game? You know, what's that look like, you know, and try not to get frustrated. So there's this whole roller coaster. And then when the game is over and the stadium is empty and we're finished putting stuff away and cleaning up, we get the, you know, we get the team together, the ops team and the ticket sales and corporate partners. And you just look around and, and you see everybody, um, you know, they're, they're fulfilled and they've had a good thing. So I think it goes back to coaching, right? Seeing a player develop and, and do something they didn't think they were going to be able to do and, and pushing them and leading them and guiding them again through the, those roller coaster moments. And when they've struggled and, you know, when they sat the bench and when they didn't start and they weren't happy and, you know, doing that. So I think for me, leading people is fulfilling um, because I always like to see the potential and I always like to see, you know, the, the good in people, I've probably have delayed too long sometimes on personnel decisions because I'm like, you know what? I think this person is, you know, they're on the bus. They're, they're maybe not the right seat. So you try to move them to a different role. They do well, they struggle. You work with them again. But I always like to, you know, give people that benefit of the doubt. So I think as a leader, you know, you have to be, uh, you know, able to do that. And you have to find out, you know, what do you want to get out of it? What I want to get out of it is I want to see people grow. I want to see them develop and I want to see them really be fulfilled. And, um, you know, so far I've been, been fortunate that way. And there's always some disappointment that comes along with it. 
Um, but it's just, it's come natural to me you know, to be honest in terms of, you know, the kind of progression into the coaching piece. And um, again, just being fortunate, being around some people that were much better leaders than I will ever be, but just grabbing some bits and pieces from them and, and seeing, I think also how much they enjoyed it. Um, I've never had a boss that looked miserable, you know, and I think that was really crucial for me, whether it was at Missouri State, our associate athletic director, Coach Bill O'Neill was a football guy, but he loved the soccer team. Like he loved us and how hard we worked. And he was a crusty, old, tough guy um, to work for, but he never looked miserable. You know what I mean? Even on the worst days, like if you had to go in and give him bad news, he'd still be like, is that all you got? I'm like, yeah, coach, that's it. All right, <laughs> that's all you let's, got. let's move on. I love that. You know, that is the that's quote, not that bad. That is the quote of quotes for today. That's all you got. I yeah. love it. I love it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it just, again, you got to put yourself around people that, uh, that you enjoy being around and, um, you know, and you get little takeaways from them, you know, hundred percent. All right. So the last pop, cause I want to be respectful of your time, but I want to hit on this because it came to mind in the conversation <clears throat> leaders, right? Most of most good leaders are very empathetic. They care, they connect everything that we've been talking about today. Right. How do you not, how do you deal with um, someone not reaching their potential? Do you own that? Do you take that on? And how do you how do you how do you manage through that? Yeah. Um, so in St. Louis, I was fortunate enough to be a part of a, a culture at, um, that was started at Worldwide Technologies, which is an unbelievable company and a billion dollar blah 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 whatever. But their culture is like one of the best. And Jim Cavanaugh is their CEO, and he was the CEO of the board um, where I was and uh, Tom Strunk was a CFO and they were really about people, but at no point um, did I ever feel like they were my friend. You know, I felt like they were definitely overseeing us, leading us and driving us and pushing us. Um, but there, when we didn't do well, you know, we would discuss it and we would talk about it, whether we missed budget on something or team performance. We always had discussions and there was always real open, honest discussions, but they live by one principle um, that I really live with, with our coaches, uh, with our players, with, with everybody is the no surprise rule. If you have to make a change, that person should not be surprised about it. Mm. My dad put it another way. He, he, he would say this when he was working with teachers, he'd say, um, I'm, I'm working to help you. I'm working to help you grow. Uh, and, and the next move will be, I'll be working to get you out of here okay, that was, you know, uh, that was kind of pretty blunt, but uh, really it's the no surprise rule. So when somebody is struggling, you know, I take that on pretty personal and I try to spend time with them. I try to give them opportunities, um, give them a little bit more attention, maybe connect them with somebody that I think would be a good connection for them uh, to have some conversations with uh, from another group or another organization. It doesn't even have to be in sports, just could be, you know, somebody that I know that they could connect and spend time with. Um, but you take that on and you really take that on yourself, but you want to grow those people and you want to help them. Um, so if you do have to make the change, you, they're not surprised. And so when I've had to do that for the most part, people have been like, you know what? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for working with me. I know I struggled on a few things. I think I'm better at them, but I get why we're making this change or why you guys are making this change. And I think it goes back to that, again, that connection with them. Um, but you know, really making sure that you're doing everything you can for this person to be successful. And sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes it's the, it's the wrong, the wrong place, the wrong time, uh, where, where they are, maybe something they got going on personally, just not allowing them to fully, right. you know, invest sure. themselves into the organization, Absolutely. but you want right. to be there for them to help them through those things too. Right. Um, so it, it just, it just, uh, you know, try to try to own it, try to put time. And then I think you have to go back and say, okay, why did that person take another job? Or why did that person not become successful? And we had to, um, you know, we had to make a change. So the debrief uh, is just as important. I think that's a one-on-one -on -one thing, or that's where you go to a mentor. So that's why I pick up the phone and I'm like, hey, you know, Pat, you got 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Here's what happened. I got somebody that was struggling, spent a lot of time with them, felt they're making progress and they just went completely back the other way here's what i all right well what'd you do well, you know what you talk about what's your timelines and then you know you, you get some ideas and you get some things there and 
Uh, again, it goes back to the coaching piece where everybody thinks coaches are very closed off and the Bill Belichick's of the world, right? They don't tell anybody anything. That's all BS. Everybody yeah. shares everything and everybody helps everybody. Yeah. And I was really surprised when I came into this role um, in St. Louis was how open people were be like, hey, you got questions? Call me. I was like, okay. You know, and then you still, you maintain those connections. So there's people that I met when I first started at the pro level in 2014 that I call now to ask for advice or to say, hey, I got somebody that we brought on staff. I was really high on them, really that they're going to, you know, absolutely kill it for us. They're struggling. All right, well, let's talk about it. And then from there, you devise a plan to try to help them work their way through it and, and have success. Because at the end of the day, you want them to be successful, whether it's here or somewhere else. You know, it's interesting is, you know, what I came back to in my thinking about your description of how you deal with that is this no surprise rule. Really, that goes back to this philosophy of the defense, right? If I'm always on, if my defense is always good and I'm always there and I'm always on and I'm always honest and there's and there's going to be no surprises with my people, then there's not going to be a surprise. Right. And then we can go out and attack and do what we need to do. It just your philosophy is connecting everywhere. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so, well. I, oh, it's awesome. It's, uh, on purpose or not, but it's yeah. it, it does it's working coming together and you know just trying to trying to continue to grow and learn and that's why I enjoy conversations like this and enjoy you know listening like I said to podcasts and stuff because you know you grab two or three things and uh, it's worth your time and yeah. you know figuring out some stuff. So no, for good. sure, you know, and the one thing we don't really get to a whole lot in these podcasts and somehow I got to figure this part out is you know, all this great stuff that we try to bring in terms of nuggets and deliver and invest and allow people to unlock their potential is um, there's a lot of scars and burns and bruises behind all of these ideas, right? And so, you know, I don't know if that necessarily helps or hurts, but I think it's good to recognize that, you know, that, that the journey is filled with lots of rough waters, lots of bailing out the boats, lots of difficult conversations, lots of sleepless nights and those kind of things, but that's okay because it's what delivers you the good stuff, right? Absolutely. I'll never forget going into the final four my senior year. We're playing in New Jersey. Um, I, I was on the bench uh, for the quarterfinal game at home. Didn't get into, into the game. We won big party at Wright College, so big parties, big celebrations. You're going to the final four, first time ever, and uh, we fly in New Jersey. And head coach Toby Bears pulled me aside. He said, hey, um, this is going to be tough, but we're playing on turf. You are not a turf guy, which is code for saying I was slow, which he was true. That was right. He said, so I'm not going to have you in the 18. Here I am a senior. think I'm going to go be a coach. Right. And he said, he goes, he said, so this is a very difficult conversation for me to have, but I'm, I'm happy to have it because now when you have to do this in your future, you'll be better prepared because you'll have a story, an instance that you can rely on that you can go back to. And he said, you'll be a better coach and a better leader because of this disappointment right now. And we're sitting in a locker room in Trenton, New Jersey, and I'm sitting there going, really? You think this is gonna make me a better person? Because I wanted to come across the bench and, you know, but I bit my tongue and dealt with it. Yeah. And he's right. And it has made me, because you've had to go through those things and those scars and stuff. And, um, you know, and that's, again, it goes back to the no surprise piece too, is walking, I, I always tell our, our revenue, people that are on the revenue side, our merch and dice or whatever, like, look, if we're going to miss budget or if we make a mistake or we, we bought this new hoodie and got it all, you know, CFC'd up and ready to sell and nobody bought it, that's okay. Just come in and let's talk about it and let's learn from it. So yeah, we could do a whole nother, you could do a whole nother po podcast just on scars and battle wounds and stuff like that, but you have to be willing to learn from those things. And then it's just as important that you tell, like you said, everybody else, that it's okay to have those scars too and to make those mistakes and and you live and learn from them and um you know i think especially coming out of covid for sports teams we've had to make some mistakes to try to get people to come back in and be comfortable in our in our environments to get people to because during covid everybody realized oh we don't really have to have sports in person you know we can watch them in empty stadiums we can watch them in these closed bubble things and it's not the same and we're starting to come back from all that stuff but We've had to make some mistakes over the last two years, but we're learning from them and we won't make those mistakes in 23 and our staff won't make those mistakes. But um, I, I've never tried to, you know, coach by fear and have people, you know, afraid to make mistakes because you're not growing. And if we're, as long as we're growing, we're going to be okay. Exactly. I love it. As long as we're growing, we're going to be okay. And that's where we're going to end it. That's where we're going to end it. Perfect. 
I really appreciate your time, Jeremy. This was really great. I mean, I've got, uh, I don't know, three pages of notes on this one. So I appreciate all of, it, all of that. And so everyone watching, um, please, you know, we're going to put all the notes down below. So make sure you can look at it. And, um, and just like with all of our guests, um, Jeremy's very accessible. If you can get through him probably on LinkedIn, probably the easiest way. Um, but you know, every person that has been on our show has been a giving person. So they like, just like Jeremy says, connecting is everything. So if you have some questions or things, I'm sure Jeremy would be okay with you reaching out to him. But, uh, you know, um, the last thing is, so Jeremy, if someone tells me I'm not a turf guy, that just is code for I'm slow. Is that where I need to take this? Correct. Okay. 100%. Yeah. Okay. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for not listening. And what was that? I said he was not wrong, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for tuning in uh, to this episode of the CEO for Life Experience podcast, um, where everything that we do, our mission entirely is just to inspire you to unlock your potential. That's what it's all about. You're full of it. You are the CEO, not only of uh, your life, but also your, your trajectory and where you go. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you on the next episode.